This evening, we want to talk a little about the problem of universal law, as we find this exemplified in the philosophies of various peoples. There is a considerable amount of conflict in the minds of many devout persons about the concept of law. We so often think of the term on a legal level, associating it with innumerable restrictions and limitations or peculiarities relating to our own cultural platform. We think of law as something found in great books which have to be studied with emphasis upon precedence and upon all the elaborate machinery of human jurisprudence. And because this is law as we have come to know it, the term universal law has some rather unfortunate semantic implications. We think of law perhaps as just, but we are also inclined to suspect that it is cold, that it is something with very little consideration for the peculiar problems and necessities of human beings perhaps broadly protective, but often a frustrating influence upon individuals. Thus, in philosophy and religion, we must have a larger concept of law. We must take away from it this tremendous emphasis upon thou shalt not, which seems so often to be important in a penal code. To the idealistic philosopher, Law represents not only the eternal will of the Creator for its creation, but also encloses within its concept and structure the other aspects of the Godhead, namely wisdom and love. Sometimes we think that these principles operate differently, but the wisest of mortals have experienced within themselves the simple fact that universal law is the greatest good, the greatest beauty, the greatest love, the greatest wisdom that man can know. Law does not exist to circumscribe or limit the activity of anything. Law exists to permit and sustain the eternal unfoldment of life. Law is forever protective, and it gives to man one tremendously important psychological security. It tells him that this law will preserve, perfect, protect every creature that is true to it, and that through being true to law, man attains all other good things possible to him, and therefore that a lawful life, a life lived in harmony with law, is a good life, a kind life, a generous life, one thoughtful and filled with understanding. Thus from fear of law, which was perhaps man's first reaction to the unknown, came respect for law, later admiration, finally love, and perhaps in the highest mystical sense, adoration. Law finally becomes the blazing living symbol of the divine power itself. And perhaps the very ground of law is its own lawfulness. A law is meaningless if, like mortal statutes, it is subject to innumerable variations, compromises. If we could buy or bribe universal law, there could be no integrity in our world. Yet from early time, philosophy and religion have been in conflict. Philosophy affirming law, religion constantly seeking to modify law, supplying in its place certain other things, grace, forgiveness, and vicarious atonement. Yet actually, whether religion knew it or not, there is no good thing in religion, no promise of spiritual security, no path of life leading to identity with good. 
but that this security or this path is also part of law. For every quality by which man, through growth and development, can attain to the highest ideals and dreams of spiritual integrity, every ingredient of universal procedure is within law. Now we try to define how we shall understand law. Perhaps we may say that the law, universal law, is the divine will in operation. It is this inevitable, perfectly enlightened purpose, this inevitable of the universe fulfilling its own destiny, this absolute sufficiency by which the plan already conceived, sustained, and perfected in the divine consciousness unfolds resolutely and without deviation into the full realization of itself. Thus we have no recourse beyond law. For if law be the divine will, in what way shall we oppose it? And if it be a manifestation of the divine purpose, by what right do we question it? How can we go beyond that pattern or plan which is the total of ourselves? How can we, as fragments of the infinite, doubt the infinite of which we are the fragment? We have no direction to turn, no place to hide ourselves from the fact of law. Therefore, wisdom has long implied that man's greatest good is a joyous, a consecrated, a voluntary obedience. The law tells us that all disobedience must ultimately be dissolved in obedience, inasmuch as the law itself, being inevitable and irresistible, cannot be indefinitely resisted. Any being or creature may for a time or under a circumstance attempt to violate this law. But the law is greater than he is. Not only is it greater than the individual, but it is greater than the totality of creation. Therefore, in the end, the law bends all things back to itself. It remains the ultimate. And in this recognition, and in this acceptance, man realizes that security is in obedience, insecurity arises from disobedience. Now, disobedience is possible to man because he has an individual mind. But this disobedience does not make him master of the law. He may, through his own ignorance, his carelessness, his indifference, or his forthright antagonism, attempt to set up his own empire, contrary to the empire of space. But space, like a vast ocean, moves relentlessly on its way, dissolving, breaking down, removing every barrier to the fulfillment of itself. As Buddha pointed out, a very great deal of human misery is man forced to stand and watch his own disobedience swept away. He weeps over it. He is miserable about it. It was a pet project of his own. And when it goes, he feels that the bottom is out of the universe. But actually, the law can destroy nothing that is unlawful. The law can be in conflict with nothing, except that which attempts to violate its principles. The wise man has learned also that to live nobly and wisely is to live almost without awareness of law. Law becomes a tremendous dominant force only in the experience of the lawbreaker. To keep the law is to be kept by it, to move serenely without sense of limitation. To violate the law is to feel the heavy displeasure of this opposition, not because the law does not like us, not because it turns revengefully upon an individual, not because it is burdened with a personal jealousy against something, but simply because the law, like water flowing down a mountain, will find its way, must find its way, must keep its own course, and will not tolerate anything that blocks or interferes with that course. This courage and strength and security which law bestows is the natural heritage of every honorable person. And it is only the individual who has some ulterior motive in himself who resents law 
or regards it as any encroachment upon his own liberty. For all liberty is liberty under law, liberty within the great structure of law. And the greatest liberty man has is the liberty and right of a voluntary personal adjustment by which he can choose immediately to align himself with the great patterns by which the universe is sustained. Thus with law, we can gradually come into a very friendly relationship. Universal law is, of course, much more than this grand, vast panorama of principles. Universal law is something we use every day. We use it when we cook, when we sold. We use it in business. We use it everywhere. Because if it wasn't for universal law, we could not pour water from a pitcher into a glass. If it was not for universal law, we could not walk upon the surface of the earth. And if it was not for universal law, the seeds that we plant in the earth would not grow and become a harvest. Everything we do, every invention we contrive, every instrument we create is in harmony with law or it will not operate. That is the reason why the Patent Office in Washington now asks for a working model in connection with extremely remarkable, difficult, or unreasonable inventions. Because the proof is, will they work? And they will work only if the inventor found the law governing the device. If he did not, it may be a magnificent work on paper, but it will never operate. Thus man's existence, his birth, his growth, all these things are possible only because of law. And in the larger moral sphere of our hopes and aspirations, progress depends upon law. Progress depends upon man gradually experiencing law, coming to know it, understand it, and love it. Therefore, everything that we hope for, worth achievement, peace, security, friendship, all these things depend upon the immutable operations of inevitable laws. So thus laws become very near and friendly to us. And we have added to the great pattern of universals many human codes. Most of these codes were originally rather wisely given. The great Babylonian code of Hammurabi is said to have been dictated to the scribes and sages by the god Nebo, keeper of the records of heaven. This primitive code emphasized honesty, right dealings among peoples, fair trade, and the mutual respect the rights of worship and of citizenship. These things anciently were parts of law, and they were as noble as men could devise them, because men attributed them to the gods. It was only with the increasing confusion of human life, with the rise of individual intellects, the clash of creeds, nationalism, and things of this kind, uh, that gradually laws became more complicated, increasing in number because of lawbreakers, and we have today very complicated statutes, simply because human beings are complicated and resent within themselves many of the simple virtues without which society cannot survive. Some of our laws are good, some are bad, some are indifferent. But they are all products of man's attempt uh, to bring some regulation or order into the conduct of his fellow creatures. And these things are patterned, directly or indirectly, from some concept arising in universals. Now, the ancients recognized a network of laws. And you could carry the study of law, as you must carry the study of races or nations, or even theologies, into most elaborate byways. But they also realized that there was a septenary of laws, corresponding to the other great septenaries which they recognized. And like worlds, universes, deities, continents, uh, these laws forming together a septenary were all manifestations of one law. And therefore, at the root of all life was one tremendous law. Now, this law is interpreted or understood primarily in terms of man's contact with it. The substance of this law, entirely beyond human experience, we do not know. But we know that as far as our reflections, our observations, and our resources permit, that there is a law at the root of things which is constantly causing a perpetual emergence of life. 
that this law is a law involving the principle of growth, and it has generally been termed uh, the law of evolution. Now, what does evolution mean? Not just in terms of the famous Scopes trial in Tennessee, but in the larger concept. What is evolution? Evolution is the fact of perpetual unfoldment. Evolution is growth. It is the fact that everything moves from its seed and root to the unfoldment of itself. Therefore, evolution is the unfoldment of all things from their natural roots. And it is the unfoldment of the total universe from its own supreme root, deity itself. Evolution is therefore deity, moving eternally into manifestation, and eternally improving the forms through which it manifests. Evolution is therefore infinite progress, infinitely diversified. It is everything coming of age. Or perhaps in philosophical terms, we can say that the law of evolution is the law of eternal becoming. The end of this, we do not know. That there may be an end, we can postulate. That there may not be an end, we can also postulate. Whether these eternal becomings ever fully become is beyond our knowledge. But the things are always becoming more so, or more complete, bearing fuller witness of their own natures, revealing and releasing continuously more from themselves. This we do know. We know that species are evolving, that human beings between the cradle and the grave pass through not only physical modifications and developments, but also mental, psychological, spiritual, ethical developments. We know that it is the natural instinct of all things to improve, and that this improvement is forever and eternally, eternally a release of potential. Thus evolution is the perpetual release of potential. It is the thing continuously outgrowing itself and reaching towards a greater fullness, a greater maturity. Also, therefore, our term evolution implies the larger concept of ideation, by which we mean that things do not grow from one condition to another, but through one condition to another. Ideation, like the opening of the petals of a flower, represents a perpetual unfolding of things from within, and that in a mysterious way forms are the constantly changing and improving symbols of greater and greater life release. Thus everywhere in nature things do not stand still. The grain of sand is hastening to become a star. The flower that grows in the field is growing up toward becoming a sun or a planet. Everything is growing toward a fuller expression of its own potential life. And this growth is God coming of age in its own creation. It is the infinite life becoming ever more obviously revealed, ever revealing more fully its incredible, limitless potential. Now every creature that is passing through this vast period of evolution has certain limitations upon itself. It cannot receive or interpret energies beyond the general level of its attained vehicles of expression. Thus man can grow within the gamut or range of man, and so finally he outgrows humanity. The animal can grow within the range of the animal kingdom until it also outgrows its animal kind. Growth at any time cannot be infinite or complete, for growth itself is an ever-flowing, and this process of ideation or release from within is causing life to build ever more noble mansions uh, for the principle within itself. And these bodies, these houses of this growing life, are instruments for expression, for the release into tangible action of these pressures these impulses, these instincts, these urges, which all life has locked within itself. So the ancients have this law of evolution, or the constant growth of things, an evolution theoretically beginning in God and ending in God. 
and passing in its middle distances through incredible diversities of development and structure. Everything hastening on. Life a procession going somewhere. Life never for a moment merely a diffusion going nowhere. For in the infinite will, the entire purpose of life is sustained by this law. This law is the instrument of that will, the law itself being the immediate vehicle of the divine purpose. The ancients then naturally assumed that this law was not only the first and primary, but that actually all other laws are parts of it. This law is never divided, it never forks into branches, nor are there other laws er emerging around it. All other laws emerge from within it. They are specializations and differentiations of this law. For they answer the question, how? How this law will operate? But in the root of the law itself is the question, why? And that question lies in the divine will. Thus all things in law are unfolded through the mystery of how this shall be accomplished. And out of the root law of the great principle of evolution, there therefore come the trooping procession of other laws, laws which in their minor divisions are innumerable, like the twigs and leaves of a great tree, but in their principal trunks and branches they are few, each one clearly definable, although the manifestations and ramifications may transcend our understanding. The law of evolution, then, is the key for man to his own growth the key to his own proper relationship with life, the key to the fact that never can he stand still, never can he say, under the passing hour, O oh stay, thou art so fair. Never can he pause, for in nature nothing stands still. He either moves forward by a perpetual impulse from within himself, or he retrogrades, or seems to fall backward, coming into contact violently with the flow of law, which tossing him about finally forces him back again into the natural stream of progress. He cannot survive resistance, nor can he be destroyed. He must inevitably float back into the pattern and go on, finding his security in the law and his misery in the efforts which he makes to break it. Evolution also uh, gives a tremendous moral force to man. Evolution reveals to him, for example, that basically there are not many lives, but there is one life forever growing. Evolution makes possible the realization that the lives in all things are the life of God, thereby making reasonable, probable, and acceptable the great concepts of the fatherhood of God and the brotherhood of man. The realization of this law ends forever. Man's belief in his own uniqueness Humanity is not something utterly and completely set apart. Humanity is a degree in the growth of gods. It is the degree in the tremendous motion of life. Plants, birds, animals, insects, flowers, even minerals, are also degrees in this motion of one life. Therefore, all things are bound together by one tremendous vital spark, and they are also bound together by one eternal need, the need to grow. And man has the privilege as he becomes wiser and older of helping life to grow and finding his full satisfaction in the service of life rather than the in, in the exploitation and ravaging of life. Thus unity of, of purpose becomes understandable and the great principles of universal philosophy uh, are, me are made meaningful because man recognizes his unity with all that exists and his participation in the great pageantry of growth. It also tells us that we are here in this world now to grow. The growth must never pause, and that for man growth lies in the direction of the improvement of the present instruments that he has. For by such improvement he is able to release more and more of the divine content of his own nature. A man seeking to improve improves not for himself but in order that the universal life in him may be made more perfectly manifest. Thus man, trying to live better, is actually helping deity to be released into expression through action. Thus the individual, 
by his dedication to growth, serves not only himself, but the whole universal plan. An ignorance or indifference to growth is perhaps one of the gravest evils that man can permit to endure. So life, with its eternal growth, makes the individual's life rich who grows much. And growth is, of course, the general and gradual unfoldment of instruments of manifestation for mind, emotion, conscience, heart, soul, and spirit. These things coming into greater revelation through trained, refined, organized, and skilled personalities become able to reveal their own essential natures more completely. Now out of this law, which is immutable, from which we cannot escape, and from which there is no end except fulfillment, a fulfillment so infinite and ultimate that we can scarcely dream of it, but a fulfillment that is not in itself the major consideration at the moment, that we will fulfill, we know, in our faith. The immediate problem is the next step. What is now necessary to keep faith? For when we keep faith with the law, we keep the faith. We have no recourse beyond this. Now out of this primary and eternal motion, the motion that sustains the whole cosmic chain of worlds. Man recognizes a second law. Out of the first, related to it, but revealing its manifestation more expertly. As the Chinese say, each long journey begins with a single step. And this great journey of evolution is by a series of steps. Each step in itself perhaps not ultimate, not highly significant, but each step achieving its part of the journey. The steps are brief, faltering, and inconspicuous, but the journey is great and meaningful. And this law then, which helps us to take the steps of the journey, helps us to walk along this great road of evolution that leads on beyond the stars and space. We call this law cause and effect. Cause and effect tells us to a great degree how we evolve and how the machinery of evolution comes to operate in the life of the individual. Cause and effect also has bearing upon one point which is otherwise rather difficult. We know that man at the beginning of his great evolutionary cycle was in the greatest need of knowledge, and at that time he had the least. Just as the newborn child in infancy is in greatest need of orientation, and yet is least able uh, to find its place in the world. So the law of cause and effect steps in and gives us the great formula of trial and error. Cause and effect gradually brings to our attention and to the attention of all life that growth or the motion of forever becoming is a series of related circumstances and that these circumstances lead from an infinite primary cause which resides in the divine nature and terminate in an infinite ultimate result or effect which also rests in the divine nature. Therefore, all cause, life, is flowing into effect, living. And the relationships of these patterns become essential to our gradual enlightenment. By degrees, man learns how to grow. He learns through trial and error. He learns by doing and observing the consequences of things done. He also senses that the universe proceeds through a series of related causes and effects, each cause inevitably producing an effect consistent with itself, and each effect becoming in its own turn, by its own nature and substance, a new cause, which in turn leads inevitably to an effect. This goes on uh, in an almost inconceivable cycle. A man has to gradually become aware that this pattern of cause and effect is valuable to him 
not because it necessarily merely relates to his own moral conduct, but because it explains to him the mystery of antecedent causes, proving gradually to him that everything that exists now has had a previous existence in cause, and that any circumstance that arises must be the consistent consequence of action. Therefore, we may call cause and effect on another level, action and reaction. We may say that everything that exists bears witness to a reason for its own existence, and that that a reason is consistent and adequate, and that there can never be an effect inconsistent with its cause, or a cause that does not produce a consistent effect. This takes what we like to call luck, chance, providence, accident, out of our consciousness as factors in existence. And it is very good for us that we should lose these concepts. For as long as man believes that he lives in an unlawful universe, or a universe of accidents, he can never develop an adequate moral philosophy. He can never recognize personal responsibility unless he realizes that his action must have reaction. He can never fully integrate himself into the concept of a vast integrated sphere unless he recognizes his own existence both as an effect and a cause. That he is here as a species, as a collective, because he is the next step in something. Because in his turn, from himself will come the next step in something. And each stage or development of things has its inevitable, unchangeable patterns. And also that once causes have been set in motion, they cannot be frustrated. They must move toward their inevitable consequences. A man, nature, or space, unfolding according to the laws of cause and effect, can never invalidate any of the procedures which have already been set in motion. Consequently, we have a new code of adjustment necessary, namely that all life must learn to cheerfully abide by the consequences of the causations which it has set in motion. The deity itself must abide by the effect created by its own primary creative impulse. Once creation begins, once the great primal cause, the fiat, is spoken or sounded, once the Logos brings forth the worlds, from that time on, the, lo the Logos, the gods and the powers are subjected to their own laws. Deity is not a being outside of law but is the power of law itself, and must forever abide by the principles which it has established. Man must therefore learn that the lawmaker must keep his own laws, and that no individual can escape from the lawful consequences of things done or things undone. The law of cause and effect has also some rather benevolent promises about it. It tells us that no thing in itself good can be without consequence. That the universe by its own nature is good. Being the product of the divine will, it is divine. Therefore, the ultimate effect of the creation as it unfolds must be good because its cause is good. Therefore, evil can never vanquish good because it can never overwhelm the great, eternal, and good cause which set all things in motion and must bring a harvest according to its own nature. Now man, in his own limited way, has always attempted to resist the great laws of cause and effect. He has attempted to reap where he has not sown. He has attempted to escape from the consequences of his own actions and conduct. But while he believes he can do this, he is under a delusion. And because of this delusion, we have had dictators and autocrats and despotisms. We have had innumerable afflictions of mankind by man simply because we do not believe the justice of universal procedure. Yet one by one the tyrants have fallen. One by one the despots have gone their way. One by one the pomp and circumstances vanish from our sight. Only the law remains. And only the simple, natural obedience gives the security that man requires. 
Now the law of cause and effect also tells us that from first cause, all causation must have in its nature necessity. Therefore, the law of cause and effect is related to the principle of necessity. And the great sphere of cause and effect is called the sphere of necessity. All things grow. Growth is necessary. All things grow slowly, often painfully, because of inability to fully understand. But man grows victoriously because he gradually learns to understand causes. He learns little by little to protect himself against forces and circumstances which might be destructive to him. He learns how to estimate the results of things. He learns thrift and providence in this way. He learns the importance of good temper and a good disposition. He learns ultimately that if he is friendly, he will have friends. If he is unfriendly, he will be friendless. These things he learns. He learns sometimes the hard way. Often he resists and rebels. But ultimately, the grand pattern of law must become apparent to him. And he must realize that he is moving again within that immutable structure. A structure so great and so universal and so ultimately perfect that there can be no resistance to it that is successful. Now the law of cause and effect operates again to another law, which emerges out of its own nature and becomes important to us. I've got a little list of them here because I want to get all seven in before the time is up. Once in a while, you know, we, we skip a little on the last one of something, and that we don't want to do tonight. Now, the law of cause and effect indicates or suggests a kind of balancing, so that we come out of the law of cause and effect with the next law, which is the law of polarity, uh, which leads ultimately to the establishment of the principle of equilibrium. Now, everything in nature, like the celestial crab, which crawls forward with a strange and angular motion, everything in nature moves according to and functions by the principle of polarity. In a, in a way, cause and effect is polarity. Cause being a positive pole, effect being a negative pole. Here we have electricity and magnetism. We have dynamic and static everywhere. We have the poles of a battery. Everywhere in life, we find the a problem of polarity operating. And polarity becomes important to us in many, many respects. Because man, through the gradual understanding of the law of polarity, has a gradual tendency to correct his own tendency to be lopsided, which becomes a very serious thing. Now, of course, when we look in the mirror, it may not be noticeable. But at the same time, in our conduct, it usually is. Polar polarity means that most forms of life oscillate or move between two poles alternating between positive and negative. Creation, for example, moves between two vast poles, manifestation and obscuration, or the day and night of the gods. Every period of manifestation must be followed by a period of repose. There is a great respiration, the breath of Shiva, the outbreathing of worlds in the great dawn of things, the inbreathing of worlds at the end of things. There is the ebbing and the flowing of the tide, waking and sleeping, life and death, winter and summer. Everywhere in nature we have these polarities, which as the seasons do in the earth. These result in the gradual ripening of things from their seed to their harvest. And without these alternations, without these constant alterations of polarities, uh, the magnificent framework of law could not accomplish its perfect work. Now in this great pattern of polarization, as we care to call it, we see innumerable things of value to ourselves here and now. One of the most common polarizations we recognize is the polarization of generation. We know also the famous reference made by Plato in his study of the great Platonic year, in which he describes that the great 25,000 year cycle resulting from the precession of the equinoxes is divided into two periods or halves one of which was a period of fertility and the other of sterility. In periods of fertility, great cultures flourish. Wisdom comes forth. Art and beauty are manifested. In periods of sterility, men lose a certain amount of internal vitality. Materialism dominates. Men cease to have their ideals. 
The earth is impoverished and no longer produces as good grain and food. And cultures have a tendency to languish for lack of both spiritual and material nutrition. Here is again action and repose. So as we have in cause and effect action and reaction, here on the laws of polarity we have action and repose. Things moving always by certain effort, accompanied again by certain periods of rest. And we also find that in nature everything is generated through polarization. And at the same time, there is a constant motion of life away from these polarized opposites toward the mysterious point of equilibrium. Now we have considerable philosophical discussion relating to this issue, and it becomes more involved than we perhaps realize. Equilibrium is to the average individual's concept an idea of the suspension of motion. Today, for example, we are proud of the fact that we are very highly polarized. We say that an individual who is very enthusiastic at one moment and utterly down in the dumps the next is really living life to its fullest. He's having his good days and his bad days, but he's certainly having a lot of excitement. Whereas if we find an individual who is by nature rather quiet and composed, we suspected him of being dead while still he is alive. If he doesn't get angry, we think he is timid. If he isn't jealous of somebody, he doesn't care for anyone. And so we make gradually a great deal out of this polarized extremism of our conduct. We had a lady in not long ago who was quite convinced her husband didn't love him, didn't love her, because for five years he had shown no sign of jealousy. It was just something he, she could hardly endure. She had no complaint, she had no reason to think he didn't. But he just wasn't jealous. That was a bad sign all by itself. So we have people who honestly believe that unless we are really quite tempestuous in our attitudes, that we haven't any. Or if we don't take violent sides in uh, arguments and debates, we're not patriotic. If we're not for our candidate and against all the others, we have no political vision. And of course, occasionally we come to a sort of negative equilibrium in which they decide none of the candidates is any good. <laughs> this, of course, is also considered bad because that is defeatism. It sounds as though we are trying to escape a nasty decision, and we are. <laughs> but we have come to think of excess as being an indication of life. Moderation is an indication of death. And uh, our psychologists are feeding us some of that thinking these days. And furthermore, they are reminding us that one of the most common symptoms of paranoia is great periods of exhilaration followed by great periods of depression. So we have our choice. If we have an exhilaration and depression, we are admired by our friends and accused of being paranoiac by our psychologists. Actually, nature is moving toward equilibrium. But equilibrium is not something that is going to sneak up on us unaware. Equilibrium does not mean that someday, whether we will or not, the pendulum is going to stop in the middle. Equilibrium is the most difficult thing in nature to attain. Because equilibrium is immortality. Equilibrium is a deathless state. It is a state in which excess ceases. All immoderations come to an end. And in the complete suspension of polarization, we attain what the Buddhist terms nirvana. For well, nirvana is the end of the imbalance of conflict in the compound personality of the human being. In the universe, equilibrium is also the end of conflict. But conflict cannot end until the conflicting factors have been resolved. And these conflicting factors are nothing more or less than the unfinishedness in things. Everything that is imperfect is unbalanced. And consequently, only perfection, which is a total equilibrium in the term of plus, uh, can have complete equilibrium. Absolute negative equilibrium, or an equilibrium in the minus, is total negation. And total negation we cannot find either. Although we find phases of negation which may nearly approach it in the purposeless, meaningless, ambitionless primitive. The human being whose desires are practically nil, whose wishes are comparatively few, and who therefore lives in what we term an ideal state of not wanting. 
He not only does not want, he has never learned to want. Man, in turn, must gradually want, outgrow wanting, and learn not to want. <laughs> but there's a great deal of difference between never knowing and outgrowing. So motion is really through polarization to ultimate equilibrium. And we are reminded, of course, of the famous line of the, in the Zohar, the unbalanced forces must perish in the void. Everything that is unbalanced must cease, must ultimately be dissolved in balance. Almost every negative emotion or negative attitude that we have is an unbalance. Therefore, hate is an unbalance. Fear is an unbalance. Anything which causes the individual to depart from his own center and become hopelessly involved in circumferential problems results in unbalance. Remember in the Egyptian Book of the Dead, the soul of the deceased is weighed against the feather of Mayat. If the scales balance, the soul may pass on into the blessed land. Therefore, balance, which is the great lesson of equilibrium, which in turn arises from man's experience of polarity, uh, this procedure, uh, through experience, brings man to one of the great discoveries, one of the great revelations of which sustain him and strengthen him for his spiritual adventure. Now, polarization affects us in many other ways. It gives us contrasts. Now, without contrasts, the lights and shadows of a picture, we call the picture very flat. Therefore, we believe in lights and shadows. But wherever we believe in them, we must endure them. And where we believe in lights and shadows, we must be believe in pain and pleasure. We must believe in hope and despair. We must believe in gain and loss. And polarity tells us that we can never have a gain without a loss. And we can never have a loss without a gain. So over the inevitable, why should we grieve? Every individual who possesses must, to one way or another, be relieved of his possession. Any individual who gives up will in some strange way re regain that which he has given away. The law of polarity is constantly operating in every department of our life. And the more extreme our attitudes become, the more vicious the swing of the pendulum. Thus the miser who has become extreme in his stupidity and will experience often the greatest tragedy in the loss of his wealth. Always where the individual is unbalanced viciously or in extensively or intensively, his problems are correspondingly modified. Great attachments mean great loss. Great attainments mean constant vigilance in the protection of a reputation so gained. Everything has its price, and this is another form of polarity. And the individual, therefore, attempting to escape from the vicious swings of this pendulum is led toward moderation of conduct, which was the great Socratic virtue. Socrates says, in all things, not too much. And the golden mean, the concept that moderation releases the mind and the heart and the soul from unreasonable attachments and frees the mind, heart, and soul for the contemplation of realities. Thus, immoderation is not only a pernicious practice as far as the general life is concerned, but it dooms the individual to the perpetuation of ignorance. For that which exists in an immoderate state is in the poorest condition to learn. Moderation leads to contemplative freedom. The individual who is not the victim of his own intensities has therefore the tranquility for contemplation, for reflection, for meditation, for natural and detached observation of values. Plato declared that he was born into this world in the profession of an observer. And man gradually has to learn by becoming observant. To the degree that he is overly personal or overly attached, he is not observant and cannot be. Because when he is uh, deformed in his judgment by the intemperances of his conduct, he is unable to estimate the values of things. Those things which he likes become increasingly unreally valuable. Those things which he does not like are not recognized for their full value. Therefore, like and dislike become polarities by which the truth is always obscured. These issues, because the young are not given the education which they usually most need. But this law of polarity, therefore, comes in in so many places, breaking through the structure of society and giving us constant evidence uh, that it is operating. Now, in the law of polarity, of course, we also have the laws which bring human beings together in various relationships, friendship, marriage, parent-children relationships. 
For nearly always, these are subtly or factually polarizing. We know in psychology that all relationships have to a measure a polar foundation. We know also man's natural desire as a human being uh, to unite with the polar opposite, not only for purposes of the perpetuation of the species, but also for association, comfort, inspiration, and understanding. All these factors indicate man's sense of incompleteness and emphasize the importance of polarity. Now this again leads to one of the more profound philosophical observations on the subject, namely that polarity lies in the sphere of manifestation rather than in the sphere of substance. Things must physically or objectively appear polarized. But in their nature and substance, all things are in themselves in equilibrium. The spirit of man is forever in equilibrium. Therefore, the spirit of man must be and is an androgene creature. It possesses within itself the capacity of polarization, but is not polarized except in manifestation. The particular and special polarization that we recognize being essentially physical. Thus, man, as a psychic or spiritual being, has an androgene core, and in the effort to establish equilibrium in his objective life, he chooses marriage, he selects his mate, and attempts in this way to balance his own nature, both persons in the marriage being actually seeking to balance their own internal lives. Through association, the two individuals are partly restored to their natural androgen state. The man through association with the woman becoming more sensitive and having certain vital experiences or which would not be possible to him alone in his polarized condition and the woman vice versa. Therefore, in all instances, again, marriage is an effort to establish equilibrium, which in turn means harmonious or the organization or integration. And just as the moderation of the mind is necessary for creativity on a spiritual level, so the union or moderation of opposites on a physical level is necessary for the generation of the human being physically. So our law of polarity operates also on these levels. The law of polarity has its polarization in our psychic lives, in our mental and in our consciousness and conscience. On the psychic level, the polarization again is this struggle between internals and externals, in which the individual is either an extrovert or an introvert. The extrovert moving excessively outward, the introvert moving excessively inward. Moderation meaning both a rich internal and external life, a situation difficult to attain. On the mental level, uh, the equivalent of the extrovert is the so-called concrete thinker, the person whose mind is directed toward achievement of some objective in the physical or visible universe. The abstract thinker is one whose mental life is turned to the invisibles, to the creativities, to the philosophies, religions, sciences, arts, where the greater amount of subjective intellect is employed. Either polarization without compromise or complement from the other can lead to excessive imbalance. And a large part of psychological imbalance is simply due to the individual moving too far in one direction and thereby violating the law of equilibrium. It is therefore important that every person with heavy physical responsibilities should have artistic, aesthetic, and cultural avocational releases. It is also important that the idealist and the dreamer and the mystic should have physical responsibilities by which he is assisted to maintain equilibrium and balance in his conduct. That is one of the reasons why it has always seemed very unwise, and from my experience it has been proven so, for individuals to attempt to depart from responsibilities in search of higher ideals. These higher ideals should be built upon responsibilities, upon the victorious and complete acceptance of duty, and not upon a running away from the need of man to serve the unknown need of God. These things must work together, must cooperate, and build toward a proper picture and a proper pattern. Now out of these principles, out of this law of polarity leading to equilibrium, which is a great silence, uh, comes another law, uh, which is perhaps one of the most pleasant and the gentle laws that we have to contemplate in life. And that is the law which we call harmony and rhythm. Now in nature, as Havelock Ellis realized, uh, life is a kind of dance. Life is a magnificent motion. The Chinese Taoist, in his concept of Tao, or universal being, recognized truth, God, reality, the road, 
all of the mysterious principles uh, which he gathered into the term Tao, he recognized these as the great Ku, or the eternal sound that goes on forever. And he also recognized this principle as the great rhythm, the great beauty that has neither beginning nor end. And out of harmony and rhythm has come man's concept of beauty. And law, perhaps, is never more perfectly revealed than by beauty. Now we can say, what is the law governing particularly the operation of harmony and rhythm? Well, I think probably, probably we will agree that the most vital law associated with these things is mathematics. Therefore, the Pythagorean and Platonic schools ad uh, admonished their disciples that no one who was ignorant of astronomy, mathematics, and music could enter the great schools of philosophy. Music, as an example of harmony and rhythm, is only one. We know, of course, Pythagoras is said to have been able to hear the music of the spheres, the sidereal or celestial music, the music that's played upon the great vena of the god Shiva. Rhythm, perhaps, is comes closest to us in the beat of the human heart. But everywhere in nature, there is harmony and rhythm revealing itself through the processes of law. Harmony is a very large word. We think of it mostly in terms of sound. But harmony means much more. Harmony means order. means equilibrium in one sense. Balance. It means the unfoldment of things with a perfection that is full of grace, full of exquisite beauty, and we discover law as beauty. One of the ways, traditionally, in which perhaps we make this discovery is in the pattern of the snowflake. Here we have immutable law revealing itself as exquisite beauty. We find it also in minute shell life and tiny living things like the radial area. We find it wherever nature is creating in the distribution of leaves along the stem of a plant, in the petals of a flower. All these manifestations are beauty. We also observe it in the sunset, in the great vista of the plains, the mountains, and the sea. We also recognize that nature is never discordant, and the wildest abandon of color in a field of flowers will never include any jarring or unpleasant color notes. Everything blends melds and molds together into a highly acceptable symphony. Now, some intellectuals working on this problem have suggested that beauty is nothing more nor less than man's becoming accustomed to things, that the way things have always been must always be beautiful, whereas anything that deviates or breaks away is no longer beautiful. We have this, of course, in musical speculation and in the introduction of dissonances, for which Richard Wagner, for one, was extremely famous. He attempted to prove that the dissonant intervals are also beautiful. For a time, he was bitterly attacked. Later, he was accepted, and it finally agreed that in spite of the unfamiliarity, there is actually in music no basic dissonance. Everything can be made beautiful if we know how. And if we use these intervals wisely and beautifully, they become beautiful. The law of harmony and rhythm also points out to us that life itself is a geometrical mystery, that the human soul is a geometrical marvel, that everything in life wants to be beautiful, presses forward to symmetry, and that law, wherever it has its perfect work, results in perfect beauty. The deformity, therefore, is in some way a limitation, a restriction, a falling short of nature's plan, and that even though perhaps nature must do a little experimenting in the effort, even experiments are beautiful in nature, which is more than we can say of futuristic art. But in any event, nature is forever moving in patterns that are strangely, grandly, and wonderfully acceptable to us. Standards of human beauty are forever changing, yet the quest for beauty is eternal. And the law of harmony and rhythm means that ultimately that which is harmonious and that which is rhythmic must fulfill the need of beauty. Harmony is a little different from rhythm in the sense that rhythm represents interval or tempo, whereas harmony represents blending, the union of things, in this it changes or differs again from melody. 
or the melodic line represents a, a tune that is recognizable. But harmony is the bringing together of things, of tones, of patterns, themselves different, perhaps set in different tonal patterns, but all coming together in one magnificent blending as a magnificent symphony of Beethoven. Thus harmony is achieved through the soul power, for in harmony we must call upon the full orchestration of universals. In harmony we must be able to conduct the orchestra. Each instrument must play its part and we must bind them together until they become one living instrument, like one great vital living pipe organ. In our living and thinking and breathing and hoping and fearing, therefore, the ancients advised that in all things we should seek harmony and that in all things we should attempt to attain rhythm. The uh, ancient Greeks were much given to a very literal interpretation of symbolism. And our old friend Socrates, who was not perhaps our idea of the figure of the Apollo, was addicted to the Terpsichorean muse and always danced with his disciples in the early morning. It might not have been an aesthetic sight for others, but it was a great aesthetic satisfaction to Socrates, which after all was the important point. And so, uh, seeking to move with life, to dance the dance of life, we must also realize that it is not only work, that it is not only labor, struggle, effort, magnificent challenge, but it is also a matter of grace. And that things done graciously and beautifully have a peculiar virtue in themselves. And to be done beautifully and graciously, they must be done harmonically and rhythmically. The human being's psychological integration is nowhere more evident than in the reaction upon conduct in terms of great harmony. The uh, neurotic, the introvert, the psychotic, is seldom able to control his body in a rhythmic, harmonious way. His actions are abrupt, angular, broken, like his attitudes. And he does not have the wonderful sustaining power of uninterrupted motion. And we all know that with an automobile, one of the greatest extravagances is stopping and starting that it takes much more gasoline and electricity to get the car constantly going from a dead stop than it does to keep it running. It is the same way with the energy content of man. If the human being can flow from one action to another without interval, without break, without the sense of interruption, so that no matter what happens, it may cause a brief change in the program, but never an interruption, the person finds that his energy resources are conserved because harmony and rhythm are the most economical ways of accomplishing things. And the moment intensity, the moment uh, loss of harmony is experienced, there is loss of energy, loss of time, inefficiency. The individual is not up to his normal standard. Whereas if he moves quietly, rhythmically, harmoniously, graciously through life, he will find he can accomplish much more because he will not be faced with repairs uh, as a result of ill-considered or unreasonable attitudes. So harmony and rhythm move with us in every part of life. Worship is always or nearly always accompanied by music, often by dance, frequently by processional, by magnificent chants, masses, which have profound effect upon the individual because they are expressions of great rhythm and harmony. And religious music helps to set the tempo for the devout person, helps him to relax into the mood suitable for worship. But the musical modes of the Greeks have similar meaning because they had modal music for practically every occupation and activity of man. And we know in modern musical therapy the importance of music in industry, of music in the home, in the school, in the hospital, because music helps the individual to restore a certain sense of harmony within his own nature. So in all things, the harmonious person is greatly rewarded, whereas the individual who has no harmony in his soul is already gravely punished and is burdened with duties, responsibilities, for which he has very little gladness in his own makeup. And for that reason, he loses much of the privilege and joy of living. Now out of these four laws, there comes another. And this law, again, is merely an expression of those that went before, using a curious combination of cause and effect, polarity, and harmony and rhythm. And this law emerges as one of the great laws of the ancients. 
the law which they recognized and which we have totally or almost totally rejected. And that is the great law of analogy. Analogy was to ancient man the universal key to all knowledge. And it was based upon the fact that nature is infinitely repeating its own processes. Uh, Leonardo da Vinci became one of the greatest exponents of the law of analogy. He found, for example, all the motions, stresses, and tensions of the human body captured in miniature in the human hand or in the human foot. He found all of society captured and held in the human face. He recognized that all things are alike in substance and principle, differing only in size and the number of their related parts. Thus all creation suspended from one creative power, moving therefore from one basic archetypal pattern. The laws governing the universe must inevitably force all things to a vast internal similarity. Laws operating upon substances and elements, molding these substances and elements into innumerable structures, it can be discovered by the analysis of the structures because all of them must have archetypal conformity with the vast pattern upon which they are designed or from which they are taken. Therefore, we have the great hermetic statement of this law, supposed to have been found by Alexander the Great in the tomb of Hermes Trismegistus in the Valley of Hebron. And that is, uh, this great law was inscribed upon an emerald, and it says, that which is above is like that which is below that which is superior is like unto that which is inferior. This means that there is a tremendous archetypal sympathy between the universe and the electron. That actually the cell, the atom, each of these is a little world, and the world is the great cell, the great atom. That everything actually moves upon one basic key pattern and who possesses the key to that pattern possesses the key to all knowledge. This means or meant to the ancients that if man could ever understand one thing completely, he would know all things. It's quite a challenge because he's never gotten very far even on that project, but he's still working on it. But uh, the uh, old alchemists gave us a little rather encouraging thinking on that process. They said, for example, the deity in its infinite wisdom had given man three books to read. One, the Holy Scriptures, the second, the universe, and the third, man himself. And that in these three books were the secrets of all things. The most difficult to explore would be the universe. The most difficult to intellectually understand would be the Scriptures. The simplest, most immediate, and that for which we have an inevitable and well-recognized sympathy is ourselves. Therefore, man actually possesses or contains within his own structure the key to all other things. That there is not one principle in space that is not somewhere in man. That there is no law operating in space which does not operate somewhere also in the compound construction of the human being. Consequently, the motive for, perhaps for the great adage of antiquity, man know thyself. Man cannot always explore other things successfully. He can examine the rocks, but he loses the great geological lessons long before he has mastered them. Man may explore space, but still he comes only to the mystery of more worlds to conquer. He may study theologies endlessly, but they are somewhat strangely detached from his own experience, and he, there is in them so much conflict that man often becomes discouraged. But within himself, searching inwardly, exploring the mysterious recesses of his own total being, man has available the only thing he can really understand and the only thing he can really know, his own life. It must be that the answer is there, otherwise there could be no answer, for man can never live someone else's life, nor can he know with certainty the depths of the heart of another person. So all the answers all the way from the shallow externals of his present ignorance to the deepest profundities of his divine origin. All these things must be within himself. And by recapitulation, 
infinitely repeated within himself. The mystery of his body must be in every drop of blood, the total of his consciousness in every nerve cell. Every organ must tell the story of all others. Every sense perception must contain the others. And the total human being, in his life and experience, must have within him all life, all experience, both relating to causes and effects. Through this contemplation, the human being, seeking to know the workings of the world, finds these workings wonderfully unfolded through his own personal nature. Thus the law of analogy helps him not only to recognize this wonderful concatenation, as we call it, or a sequential descent of similars, but it also helps him uh, to be aware that all bodies are houses for souls. All souls are housed in bodies. That all things visible have their relationships to things invisible in the same manner, though differing perhaps in quantity, quality, or degree. That essentially all things have the same geometrical design, just like the septenary itself, which is diversified through every level and layer of human society and universal procedure. Thus the law of analogy enables us to study the greatest from the least. Also enables us to approximate the structure of the universe as far as it is qualitatively concerned. The substances in terms of living essences by which the universe is sustained. All these things we come to know. Paracelsus was of the opinion also that because of these sympathies within our own natures, we had a bridge or binder between these similarities in ourselves and the greater archetypal patterns in space. Thus, if the human being could understand some motion, some energy, some principle within himself, he was then capable of the apperceptive experience of the universal correspondence. As the tuning fork contributes its tone to another fork of similar pitch, so the individual's participation, the energy of in himself of a certain quality, creates a sympathy with all energy of that quality, giving man the possibility of a cosmic experience of that energy through the discovery and experience of it within himself. These things he can do, but from the outside he can never conquer these energies, because he can never approach anything from the outside and know it. He may examine it, he may analyze it, he may come to some decision concerning its structure and form, but all things are known only from within. But from the withinness of himself, Man is in harmony with the withinness of all other things. From the outside, he can never attain this rapport. So the law of analogy, analogy goes on and on through all the different departments of experience and life and gives us a vital and important uh, understanding. Now in your northern or Mahayana system of Buddhism, uh, five of the celestial Buddhas are recognized. Two are concealed. In the human sensory gamut, five senses are functioning. Two are not. These two represent those yet to come. In the great racial evolution of man, five races have come. Two have yet to come. In the great continental distribution, five continents, two yet to come. Therefore, in the great septenary of laws, five have been revealed and two are concealed. Now, in your astronomical system of the ancients, there is reference to the seven planets. Yet the ancient did not know seven planets. He knew only five planets, and he added to these the luminaries, the sun and moon, to make seven. He was well aware that the sun and moon were not planets, but they became the shields, or the blinds, or the symbols for the two planets which were not then known. In the same way, there are five laws that we now know and two laws that cannot be known to us until through our own experience and through our own growth we unfold the sensitivity of them or to them from within our own natures. They are operating, but we cannot yet differentiate them. Perhaps we shall learn something of them through our atomic researches, which are coming gradually and which will undoubtedly expand until ultimately we shall come face to face with universal principles and laws that we do not yet recognize. But the ancients recognized that there were seven laws, only five of which were known. Therefore, to complete their septenary of laws, they added two shells, or two symbols, symbolic laws, which are actually uh, derived substantially from other laws, but which are now advanced to fill in the septenary. 
and to cover for the ones that are not as yet known. For actually, the law of evolution actually covers the law of rebirth, and the law of cause and effect covers the law of karma. So our difference has been that we have taken these two laws, re rebirth or reincarnation, and cause and, uh, and karma, and we have declared them to represent laws operating upon the moral level of human conduct, and use these two to complete the septenary. The law of rebirth would be an inevitable correlative of evolution, because actually evolution, operating through cause and effect, must be the perpetual growth of things. And the perpetual growth of things contains within its own concept everything relating to the continuing improvement of forms and the re-embodying of life principles in forms until they attain their maturity or perfection. Therefore, reincarnation is to us the law of evolution applied to the moral and ethical life of the individual. And the law of karma is the law of cause and effect brought within the personal experience of the individual and his problems. These are the two laws that cover uh, the greater laws that remain as yet unrevealed. So by means of them we create the septenary. Now what can we add at this time to a discussion of the law of reincarnation that would not more or less parallel material we have previously uh, covered? There are some points, I think, that uh, might be valuable because we are now thinking in terms of a septenary of laws. And we are therefore assuming and affirming that these laws exist and that these laws are necessary to the fulfillment of the primary law and that all laws make evolution complete. For it is the root law, like the root race or the root power in relating to the other septenaries that we have considered. This law, the law of reincarnation and karma, these two laws, have one important peculiarity. We call them uh, symbol laws or blinds or cover laws to conceal something else that we do not know. Buddhism would consist, consider this highly correct because it would tell us that these two laws, peculiarly applicable to man, exist on the level we know them only because of the mind of man. That reincarnation and karma, therefore, are man-made laws, yet related to and dependent upon almost completely two great universal laws. One of the reasons why this is true is because Buddhism points out that these laws are both based upon man's acceptance of certain illusions in his own nature. The law of rebirth is based upon man's acceptance of the need to survive as a person. This law is not primarily involved in the original concept of evolution, because evolution has nothing to do with man surviving. Evolution has only to do with God perfecting. And man in this pattern becomes only an instant or a moment in the evolution of a divine being. But man, with his own peculiar attachments to things, considers his own survival as an individual far more important than his ultimate renunciation of selfhood in order that deity may be perfected. Thus man, striving desperately to survive as a being, sets in action mental processes which carry forward from embodiment to embodiment in the form of an intellectual continuity of self-consciousness. Thus the individual wills himself to exist as himself. And as long as this will or this remote but powerful desire continues, the individual is surviving as an individual rather than accepting uh, the Buddhist concept that actually only reality is immortal and that therefore man's ultimate attainment is absorption in reality. But the law of reincarnation was long accepted in the East, drifted over the caravan routes, and finally through the uh, travels of Pythagoras and the conquests of Alexander and the journeys of Apollonius, finally reached the Mediterranean area and the Aegean to influence our entire southern European and North African cultures. This coming into
contact with the Western concept of life was modified to sustain the idea of man's gradual uh, growth through re-embodiment into a divine being, into a separate godling, having infinite personal powers. This concept has influenced our immortality theories from the beginning of Western culture. But this, to the Eastern mind, is only a veil, because our great goal is not that the individual shall be perfect, but that the total shall achieve its own completeness, and that in this process, races, creatures, beings, innumerable, are created and vanish into limbo, nothing real ever dying, nothing unreal ever surviving, and that finally, in the infinite ultimate of things, we shall discover this spark of life within ourselves is not our own, but is the eternal spark blazing in us. Ultimately, through service of this spark and final identification with it, we fulfill our own destiny. This, however, will uh, not be a problem of too great importance uh, in the vital experience of the individual. He could not separate this spark from his own personality by any effort of the will. He can only, through the fulfillment or keeping of laws, finally relax his immoderations on an egoistic or egocentric level until gradually, through the increase of total integration or placidity within his own consciousness, he will relax his selfness and, like the mystic, become more and more aware of the God-selfness, and in so doing will ultimately reach this point of renunciation in which he can say with fullness of spirit, not my will but thine be done. And when that occurs, actually, deity takes over and becomes the great power, the, the reality, rather than merely for average human beings, the deity is little better than a source of energy supply. We have not yet recognized the spiritual importance of the deity value in ourselves. The law of karma, of course, is the law of cause and effect, applied on the level of personal conduct, on the, life of, on the level of an individual having moral and, and, and ethical individualism. In nature, cause and effect follows great cyclic patterns, patterns which arise in the archetypal forms of universal procedure. In man, cause and effect is most closely linked with self-conduct. In the individual, he recognizes that he himself sets into motion certain causes, the effects of which he must be ready to endure. If for some reason he does not desire to endure the effect, then he must cease to produce the cause. On one occasion, Buddha, discussing this with one of his disciples, uh, the disciple explained to him all the sorrows and miseries through which he was passing, and the Buddha explained to him that it was the working out of karma. And the uh, tired and harassed sufferer asked if there wasn't something he could do about it. And Buddha gently patted him on the shoulder and said, Yes, brother, endure it. And once the cause is set in motion, wisdom is the gentle, cheerful endurance. The only great thing to remember is, don't set it in motion again. Because the first time it can be anybody's fault, apparently. The second time it is distinctly our own. If, therefore, at any time in life, we are in the presence of consequences, which can no longer be prevented by the correction of their causes, then they must be accepted. The lesson that they contain must be accepted, and the individual uh, must preserve this information and keep it available against the possible repetition of the causes. No cause will produce an effect ex in excess of itself, nor deficient of itself, and no effect when it becomes a cause can produce a cause inconsistent with itself. Life goes on, experience goes on, as long as cause and effect go on. Yet there must be, according to Buddhism, a gradual diminution of this cycle. It cannot go forever. It may go for a long time, but in eternity all things are bound together into a complete and finished product, whatever that may be. So Buddha points out that wherever the individual in the presence of an effect is able to produce only a commendable reaction from himself. 
If, for example, in the presence of a great karmic debt that must be paid, which may result in adversity, or trial, or even pain, or loss, uh, the individual becomes indignant, fights back, blames others, becomes intolerant, vindictive. These things immediately set in motion another chain of circumstances. This is where the dharmic reaction from within himself becomes the cause of a new karmic sequence. If, however, as Buddha taught his disciples, in the presence of this type of an unpleasant situation, the individual graciously, kindly, gently, lovingly releases, holds no ill, is patient in all things, takes no extreme attitude, but attempts only to grow, to ask what the lesson is and how best he can learn it. It is obvious that his dharma has now set in motion another type of causation entirely. This causation can never produce an effect this is different from itself. And if the individual, out of an emergency, has set a causation of peace in motion, that causation must ultimately likewise produce its own end, and its end must be peaceful. Consequently, wherever it is humanly possible to reduce the intensity of the impact of an effect upon consciousness, the individual reduces the karmic load that must go forward. Wherever he understands and accepts, wherever he meets his problem, uh, with that which is the nearest to moderation, where he maintains equilibrium, never, if possible, falling away from peace within his own consciousness, he then cannot set in motion further conflict. If, with through general, general and gentle watchfulness, his entire life becomes less negatively intense, less combative, less destructive, less critical, he cannot have the same type of karma that he would have if he has not achieved these ends. Consequently, through moderation, he neutralizes the power of karma, because karma acts upon only one factor, action, reaction. Action must produce reaction. Non-action cannot produce reaction because we cannot set in motion anything as a result of absolute equilibrium. Gradually, therefore, as Buddha pointed out, uh, the disciple seeking ultimate liberation comes to the causeless embodiment, the embodiment in which the final residue of debt must be paid, but no new causation is set in motion, in which the individual sets nothing moving which can possibly come back to him as pain, sorrow, loss, or death. Having attained this more or less complete and perfect equilibrium, the karmic overload is continuously diminished. The individual then has two choices in his karma. That choice which is uh, the northern Buddhistic concept, namely, the possibility of attaining a paradisical state the uh, Sukhavati of the Northern Buddhist. This paradisical state is the individual who in the payment of karma creates only happy karma to come. He does so many good deeds. He is so generous, he is so kind, he is so loving, he is so faithful, he is so just and so true that all that he can have in the form of reaction is pleasurable. Therefore he may have the famous embodiment where he became in the legend the king and had all wonderful things for himself. He was so wonderful, so wise and so good that he was very happy until being a king turned his head then he got into trouble again. But in other words the paradise is the result of good deeds producing their natural consequences because nature is not at all partial. It just as much loves to reward as to punish. But Buddha goes further and says that the good deeds also have about them a certain foolishness, for very few people can carry happiness without ultimately destroy, uh, destroying it or spoiling it in some way. Out of fortune and good time comes arrogance. Out of a life in which everything goes well comes laziness. And one by one our little virtues are swept away by the misuses we make of them. So Buddha taught that the only ultimate release lay in the suspension of all consequence in which the life being a condition of inward tranquility 
causes the individual to inherit no debt but peace and silence. And having attained to this end, he is therefore free from the wheel of karma. Having attained such uh, attainments, the individual also moves back only into the great stream, the stream of the law carrying with it the growth of the divine being itself. And all things other than this and less valuable are slowly cast away. So we have this structure of laws. And in these laws we find the roots of patterns. The painter uses them, the musician uses them, everyone uses them. They are the ever-present help in time of trouble. And it is good for us, as human beings and as thoughtful human beings, to take our refuge in the law. Not to uh, take our hope in the fact that we can evade it. Not to take our hope that some other dispensation no longer makes it necessary. But face the simple fact that who lives the life shall know the doctrine. That in keeping the law, we give ourselves the greatest good that we can enjoy. And that by fulfilling the law in all its ways, we become aware that the law in its totality is a kind of lengthened shadow of God itself. And that in the love of law, in the embracing of law as the greatest good, we reach out and touch the very substance of the creating power. For the law is God made manifest in his works. And those who obey this great pattern are the chosen ones. For if we love God, we will keep his commandments. And these commandments are his laws, not spoken from a mountain, but revealed forever in the lives and hearts and souls of creatures. Laws that we live with every day, that rule the plant, that rule everything. And if we quietly and systematically and thoughtfully study and learn to love these laws, we will find that we live in a much better world than we ever suspected, a world in which there is more goodness than we have ever known, and a world which protects us so completely that perhaps it is not an extravagance to say that this power watches and notes each sparrow's fall. There is nothing that happens in the universe that law is not sufficient for, and which is not in itself lawful. And it is this lawfulness which is our hope, because it is lawful for us and right for us to grow, to fulfill, to achieve integrity and security, and to find the greater good we seek for. And with this kind of religious philosophy behind the concept of law, I think we can have greater inducements, universally and cosmically speaking, for being law-abiding citizens. And wherever we can, obey the law and keep the peace. And the peace we should keep, most of all, is that within ourselves. And by doing these things, all other good things come in their proper time. Well, the time is up. This evening we want to talk a little about the problem of universal law as we find this exemplified in the philosophies of various peoples. There is a considerable amount of conflict in the minds of many devout persons about the concept of law. We so often think of the term on a legal level associating it with innumerable restrictions and limitations or peculiarities relating to our own cultural platform. We think of law as something found in great books which have to be studied with emphasis upon precedence and upon all the elaborate machinery of human jurisprudence. And because this is law as we have come to know it, the term universal law has some rather unfortunate semantic implications. We think of law perhaps as just, but we are also inclined to suspect that it is cold, that it is something with very little consideration of the peculiar problems and necessities of human beings, perhaps broadly protective, but often a frustrating influence upon individuals. Thus, in philosophy and religion, we must have a larger concept of law. We must take away from it this tremendous emphasis upon thou shalt not, which seems so often to be important in a penal code. To the idealistic philosopher, 
law represents not only the eternal will of the Creator for its creation, but also encloses within its concept and structure the other aspects of the Godhead, namely wisdom and love. Sometimes we think that these principles operate differently, but the wisest of mortals have experienced within themselves the simple fact that universal law is the greatest good, the greatest beauty, the greatest love, the greatest wisdom that man can know. Law does not exist to circumscribe or limit the activity of anything. Law exists to permit and sustain the eternal unfoldment of life. Law is forever protective, and it gives to man one tremendously important psychological security. It tells him that this law will preserve, perfect, protect every creature that is true to it, and that through being true to law, man attains all other good things possible to him, and therefore that a lawful life, a life lived in harmony with law, is a good life, a kind life, a generous life, one thoughtful and filled with understanding. Thus from fear of law, which was perhaps man's first reaction to the unknown, came respect for law, later admiration, finally love, and perhaps in the highest mystical sense, adoration. Law finally becomes the blazing living symbol of the divine power itself, and perhaps the very ground of law is its own lawfulness. A law is meaningless if, like mortal statutes, it is subject to innumerable variations, compromises. If we could buy or bribe universal law, there could be no integrity in our world. Yet from early time, philosophy and religion have been in conflict. Philosophy affirming law, religion constantly seeking to modify law, supplying in its place certain other things, grace, forgiveness, and vicarious atonement. Yet actually, whether religion knew it or not, there is no good thing in religion, no promise of spiritual security, no path of life leading to identity with good, but that this security or this path is also part of law. For every quality by which man, through growth and development, can attain to the highest ideals and dreams of spiritual integrity. Every ingredient of universal procedure is within law. Now we try to define how we shall understand law. Perhaps we may say that the law, universal law, is the divine will in operation. It is this inevitable, perfectly enlightened purpose this inevitable of the universe fulfilling its own destiny, this absolute sufficiency by which the plan already conceived, sustained, and perfected in the divine consciousness unfolds resolutely and without deviation into the full realization of itself. Thus we have no recourse beyond law, for if law be the divine will, in what way shall we oppose it? And if it be a manifestation of the divine purpose, by what right do we question it? How can we go beyond that pattern or plan which is the total of ourselves? How can we as fragments of the infinite doubt the infinite of which we are the fragment? We have no direction to turn, no place to hide ourselves from the fact of law. Therefore, wisdom has long implied that man's greatest good is a joyous, a consecrated, 
a voluntary obedience. The law tells us that all disobedience must ultimately be dissolved in obedience, inasmuch as the law itself, being inevitable and irresistible, cannot be indefinitely resisted. Any being or creature may for a time or under a circumstance attempt to violate this law. But the law is greater than he is. Not only is it greater than the individual, but it is greater than the totality of creation. Therefore, in the end, the law bends all things back to itself. It remains the ultimate. And in this recognition and in this acceptance, man realizes that security is in obedience. Insecurity arises from disobedience. Now, disobedience is possible to man because he has an individual mind. But this disobedience does not make him master of the law. He may, through his own ignorance, his carelessness, his indifference, or his forthright antagonism, attempt to set up his own empire, contrary to the empire of space. But space, like a vast ocean, moves relentlessly on its way, dissolving, breaking down, removing every barrier to the fulfillment of itself. As Buddha pointed out, a very great deal of human misery is man forced to stand and watch his own disobedience swept away. He weeps over it. He is miserable about it. It was a pet project of his own. And when it goes, he feels that the bottom is out of the universe. But actually, the law can destroy nothing that is unlawful. The law can be in conflict with nothing except that which attempts to violate its principles. The wise man has learned also that to live nobly and wisely is to live almost without awareness of law. Law becomes a tremendous dominant force only in the experience of the lawbreaker. To keep the law is to be kept by it, to move serenely with